Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa and Linda, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. Hi, I'm Tim Kennelty. And I'm Jean Thomas. And welcome to another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Today, we're debuting a new format with this episode. Instead of having an interview and several regular features, each episode will be either an interview or a set of the regular features. We're streamlining the format. Streamlining's good, right? We really want to hear from our listeners if this is something that they like or don't like. We always want to hear from our listeners. So always let us know. We're online at the website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. What day is it, Jean? It's Dragonfly Day. It is Dragonfly Day. How exciting. I love dragonflies. We're talking to Larry Fetterman, Audubon guru, by the way, about dragonflies and about the Ramshorn Livingston Nature Preserve. How cool. I'm sorry I missed this when I wasn't here for this, but I can't wait to hear Larry talk about dragonflies. I think we should listen in. This is Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley, and today we're having a conversation with Larry Fetterman on the topic of dragonflies, birds, the Ramshorn Livingston Nature Sanctuary in Catskill, and whatever else happens to come up in the conversation. I always like to start with asking our guests to tell us about themselves. That way they self-edit and we hear about what's important to them. Larry, I'm going to have to limit you to five minutes because you're involved in so many divergent things. I wouldn't know where to start. So, Larry, tell us about yourself. First, thank you so much for having me on this podcast series. A great way to spread the knowledge that so many people in the area have about the natural world in our area. So, I got involved birding. I was a young lad growing up in Queens, New York, and my earliest recollection is going to the former World's Fair site in Flushing, Queens, which was near to my home uh, with my dad, and looking at the birds that were flying over Flushing Lake and wondering what gives them so much freedom and why do they enjoy what they're doing. And it just led to a, at this point, long life of enjoying birds and nature and outdoors. About 30 years ago, when my daughter was at that time, about three years old, I was taking her over for swimming lessons at Hudson High School. And as we're crossing Rip Van Winkle Bridge, she looked out and she said, Daddy, what's that big bird? And I looked out and it was an adult bald eagle. So up to that point, my local involvement with birds since I had left New York City in 1973, I wasn't very involved, but I realized I have a, a, a captive audience um, since I was Mr. Mom, for my daughter's young years. So I got involved in our local Audubon chapter, Northern Catskills Audubon Society. And that turned into a approximately 30-year adventure with Audubon New York, the state program of National Audubon. I ended up with the chapter becoming their president, their newsletter editor, their field trip leader, in other words, chief cook and bottle washer. And I turned my hobby of birding into a job working for National Audubon Society. And for 15 years, I was the education coordinator for three sanctuaries here in the Hudson Valley, one in Greene County, the Ramshorn Livingston Sanctuary, and two across the river, one in Columbia County, Rhinestrom Hill Sanctuary, and one in Dutchess County, Buttercup Farm Sanctuary. For these sanctuaries, I created and led education programs 
for all ages from young children in family groups all the way through um, college age students. And once I left Audubon, New York, I've continued to be a field guide and an outdoor naturalist, outdoor educator, and I run my own walks and talks. In fact, this morning was the second in my six-week series of bird walks at the Ramshorn Livingston Sanctuary. Since that sanctuary, A, is physically close to me, and it's just near and dear to my heart. So that's the <laughs> one of the divergent things that I'm involved with. My main career, um, I'm a professional musician. I'm a guitarist. I like to say I shared the stage with many, many country acts in my 40-some-odd year, over 40-year career. I still play in a local country band and the Shameless Commerce Division of Larry Fetterman. I'm in the country band Thunder Ridge. You can see us performing in lots of outdoor venues in the, in the Hudson Valley. One of our favorite gigs is Music in the Park in Catskill, their Thursday night series. And I also play in a duo with one of my bandmates. It's a duo called Gray Matter. So now that things are hopefully getting a little bit quieter and less restrictive due to COVID, you'll see both Thunder Ridge and Gray Matter out and about and playing some more. You're definitely a jack of all trades here. So Larry, I'm going to pick out one topic for today. The mention of dragonflies sparks some interest. So let's talk about dragonflies. You're known as an expert on birds, and I know you're involved with that Ramsforn Livingston Nature Sanctuary in Catskill. Is it a combination of your interest in flying things and wet places that got you interested in dragonflies? So I love that question, a combination of flying things and wet places. When I started with Audubon, we were basically teaching about birds and, and habitats. Right around um, early 2005, New York State decided that we needed to do a survey on dragonflies and damselflies. It's an underrepresented group of critters in our ecosystem. And there were many scientists involved through the conservation department and through a funding source, Biodiversity Research Institute. But the way that this survey was going to really work was to get an army of volunteers to do surveying. And it piqued my interest because when we study birds, the best time to watch birds is first thing in the morning at first light up until around 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. So I guess for job security, I said, well, I'll learn about dragonflies since they depend on warmth and sunlight to fly. And I jumped in wholeheartedly to learn about these critters and ended up being the statewide volunteer coordinator for the effort for the statewide dragonfly survey project. We started off in the first year in 2005 with approximately 300 volunteers now and i went across the state to teach teach about how to a how to identify them how to study them and as importantly how to catch them we, yeah as i said we started off with about 350 volunteers the first year when we were done with the survey project in the last year we had over 1100 volunteers across the state going to different as you guys put it wet places mm -hmm. that dragonflies would frequent. Impressive. So that's in a nutshell how what what got me interested and where I took my interest in flying things and okay. wet places. Let me let me to, circle uh, back fly. to the Ramshorn Livingston site. We sort of hopped over that as being a wet place. You lead walks there pretty frequently. Can you give us a little history of how it came to be? Sure. So the Ramshorn Livingston Sanctuary is a beautifully compact sanctuary. That started off in 1973 when Henry Livingston, Henry Livingston, the famous Henry Livingston from the, the steamboat, the Fulton's Folly days back in the ancient history of, of this country. So Henry Livingston donated the first 162 acres to the National Audubon Society. And this included the Ramshorn Creek, but the only access to the sanctuary was via the creek off of the Hudson River. Through subsequent acquisitions by Scenic Hudson and Audubon, the acreage of the sanctuary has increased to its current size of over 600 acres. And we are proud to say that 
we're protecting the sanctuary, which is the part of the largest tidal swamp in the Hudson River Valley. So what's available for the public to do there on their own? I know there's trails, but is there access to water travel, like with perhaps kayaks or canoes? Yes. On their own, we'll start with the trails. It's an eight-tenth of a mile walk down an, an old farm road that's very easy, easily accessed that takes you down to the Ramshorn Creek. It's a little bit interesting to try to take a canoe or kayak down because you can't drive down to the, the boat launch at the creek. But we have seen people with wheels mounted to their kayaks or canoes. But the easiest way to access by water is to travel about a little less than half of a mile south from Dutchman's Landing or Catskill Point along the shore of the Hudson, which is a nice shallow, shallow traverse. People sometimes panic when they think that they have to pa- they have to paddle out on the Hudson River, but it's very it's very shallow along the the shoreline. Larry, and then yeah, I'm afraid of water. Is there a sign? Is there a sign? If you're if you're taking your little kayak and you're going down the river looking for the spot to go over into the into the the reserve, is there a sign? <laughs> There's one wonderful marker that will let you know you're at the Ramshorn Creek. That's all I need. First thing that you'll notice on the opposite side of the river is a a white former boathouse. And that was the boathouse of Henry Livingston. And it's directly across the Hudson River from the mouth of the Ramshorn Creek. But the Ramshorn Creek is the first body of water other than the Hudson that you will encounter traveling south on the river. No famous last words. You can't miss it. <laughs> you truly can't miss it. You don't know me, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's a lot going on there. Let's let's bounce back. I'm going circular today. Where do the dragonflies come in? As we might know or might not know, dragonflies get their start in the water. They lay their eggs in every different type of, of water, from streams to ponds to lakes to the Hudson River. There are even some dragonflies that found in saltwater habitats. So with the Ramshorn Livingston Sanctuary, we've got the habitats of, of a marsh. We've got the swamp habitat. So that's perfect breeding ground for dragonflies. So they don't do caterpillars and stuff. How, what is their life cycle? What are the phases? Interestingly, dragonflies and and damselflies have what's called incomplete metamorphosis. So you just gave away the one difference between dragons and butterflies. Butterflies have a four-stage life cycle that includes the caterpillar. Dragonflies go from egg to larva, and then straight from larva, they turn to adults. And I've always had an issue with calling it incomplete metamorphosis, one would think if it's incomplete, then it never reaches adult stage. They do reach adult stage. So I've challenged the odonatologists, the dragonfly scientists, to come up with a better better phrase than incomplete metamorphosis. Where the sanctuary comes in, in addition to being the, the breeding ground where the eggs are laid, when the, the eggs hatch and the larvae have been wandering around usually at the bottom of a, of a water body, as, and I'd like to add, as they, an apex predator, they're top of the, the food chain as larvae, as well as adults. But when they, the larvae are ready to make their transformation, they need to climb out of the water onto some sort of vegetation, be it a cattail, be it some kind of a marsh grass. And at that point, they will do their, do their transformation. Their back splits open and their body pulls out. It's really <laughs> what science fiction movies are, are made of. So with the, the marsh habitat and the, the swamp, it's the perfect, perfect uh, way for these to transform from their initial egg to becoming an adult. So are dragonflies an important link in the ecosystem? And are they at risk from global warming? And I guess I should ask that ever-present question of, what do they eat? Dragonflies and damselflies, more so dragonflies than damsels, are our friends. They eat the things that like to bite us. 
They eat any of the flying, annoying insects. They eat mosquitoes. They eat gnats, black flies. They're very important to have in the, in the ecosystem. Not that there are any links in the ecosystem that aren't important, but these guys are indeed at the top of the food chain. And the only risk that we can think of that global warming could pose for them is through major, major storm events. If there's a storm after eggs have been laid, or if there are larvae in a stream, if there are super flooding events, these critters can get washed away from where they need to be, where they need to, to emerge and be part of that, that, land, that landscape. And what do they eat besides they, just, just mosquitoes and gnats and stuff like that? They don't eat any vegetables? Mosquitoes and gnats. As adults, they eat anything that flies. Oh. As larvae, when they're down in, in the water, they'll eat tadpoles. They'll eat small fish. If, if um, any of your listeners were interested in a really, really cool video, they should Google, and I guess we can, it's a, it's a verb these days, look up a video on dragonfly larvae feeding, and they'll see a, a remarkable system. We've all seen videos of, of iguanas or other lizards with their super, super fast tongue reaching out to grab their prey. Dragonfly larvae have a similar mechanism in just a hair trigger, a split second, they reach out underwater, well, in the water, and grab their prey. I have lots of dragonflies at my house, and now I'm just really grossed out at what they're doing. <laughs> but it's probably because I'm surrounded by lots of water sources. They come in all kinds of colors and sizes. Sometimes I watch whole swarms of them in the evening, dancing in the light of the setting sun. They're, those aren't all technically dragonflies, are they? Are some One, damselflies? Yeah, the ones that you see, usually it's, it's later in the day. We call it a, a, a feeding swarm. And those guys up higher above, above your house, above your yard, those are going to be all dragonflies. And they're usually mixed species. You'll, you'll see the different species at different elevations going for different flying insects. The damselflies tend to fly slower than dragonflies and usually stay closer to the ground. And the beauty of, of dragonflies, well, there are lots of myths, lots of legends. There's the spiritual aspect of dragonflies. They are a, a symbol of reincarnation or rebirth. The history of that goes, goes back to when people didn't quite understand where they came from. They might have known that there were these little critters swimming around in their pond, then all of a sudden their little critters are gone, but the dragonflies are now around. So there is the, the rebirth aspect of it. Dragonflies have nicknames, as, as I said before, with damselflies, I grew up calling them darning needles because one of the old wives' tales, if we can say old wives' tales in this politically <laughs> correct era, people thought that when you slept, dragonflies would sew your mouth, your lips together. <sighs> if only. Which, of course, they don't do. <laughs> um, and I can't, I can't stress enough how beneficial these are to have around. They do not bite people as incredibly scary to some people. Their long, skinny abdomen, the long, skinny body part might appear. They do not have a stinger at the end of it. The end of the abdomen is used in mating. So one should not be afraid thinking that if one, if a dragonfly lands on me, it's going to sting me or bite me. In doing our surveys, I would show people how, what the dragonfly mouth looks like. Because we, when you survey them, you have to catch them and you, you catch them with a, a typical insect butterfly net. And they're very resilient. One can swing a net very quickly and you have to swing quickly to catch them because they can fly at speeds up to 30 miles an hour. So once we have them in hand and we can, we can show them several different features about them. And I've shown how they can, if you hold a dragonfly on the top of your hand, if it's curious, it will try to take a nibble off your skin. And for most of us, their nibble will not, not break the skin. Well, now we're thoroughly in love with these little guys, not only because they've inspired artists with their beauty, 
Thanks, Larry, for sharing with us. I must warn you, though, we'll be asking you to come back to have more conversations with us about nature in our Hudson Valley. Thank you, Larry. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, and I would love to come back and talk about some more of the the wonderful world of nature in the valley. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Linnell and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at columbiagreenmgb at cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 